Thank you, uh, our MC. I think it's our honor today to have you know, a distinguished uh, panelist here. Right? Uh, I won't you know, go through in, in detail their experience, but suffice to say that we're going to draw out the best of their experience. Right? I think you know, from Port uh, Noaisha, the Penang Smart City you know, uh, development that we are looking forward to hear from, and then, of course, you know, from uh, Mr. Ku's side, whereby, you know, I think this morning, uh, the KSU and, and Huawei just launched the, the book, this book called Malaysia Towards Becoming ASEAN Digital Capital, where it captures, right, the digital city, you know, uh, interesting initiative that can position Malaysia, right, for the ASEAN countries. And of course, we have the expert from Ting City, right, architect herself as well, Ahila, and uh, and we have uh, Mr. Prabud also. Yeah, thank you very much. We hope to draw on his experience on the engineering side of it, right? How do we make, you know, our, our uh, so-called resources, our infrastructure more efficient, more effective? Now, to start with, right, I think today, if you look at our current situation, right, more than 50% of the global population actually live in city. Now, this will continue to rise to about, all right, according to United Nations statistics, 68% by 2050, right? What it means is that if you look at Malaysia, right, I was just looking at Malaysia, 77% of our population actually live in city and urban areas, right? However, when you have a huge population in the urban area, what it means is that it will bring together, right, the burden to the infrastructure, to the economy, to the health, the societal, and also the environmental challenges, isn't it? So according to McKinsey Global Institute, right, uh, the use of technology can improve the quality of life indicators by up to 30%, right? So today, we're going to talk about that, the digital technology, and how, right, this, you know, digital city can be both, you know, a uh, uh, challenge for us, but indeed, you flip the, the other side of the coin, opportunity for all of us, right, in this room as well. So let's start with, you know, um, the, the, you know the, the first question itself. I think if you look at smart city, right, or the digital city, in, indeed, according to some market research you're talking about, it's a six trillion US dollar market by 2030, right? And, and traditionally, if you look at, you know, this sector, real estate, construction industry is the least digitized industry, right, among all the industries. However, that also presents opportunities. As digital technology continues to converge, I think when we talk about digital technology here, perhaps we can refer to it to A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? A for AI, artificial intelligence, B for blockchain, C for cloud computing, D for big data, E for internet, everything, and then FG, 5G. So with the convergence of this technology, indeed, right, it brings about risk and opportunity. Risk in the sense that it actually disrupts the traditional industry. Opportunity in the sense that if you are a disruptor or you continue to innovate, therefore, you also bring about right, changes for the betterment of the humankind, the quality of life, the efficiency, and therefore, also solve some of the pain points in the industry. So first question, I think maybe, you know, uh, we ask about, you know, how do you see the supply and demand situation now for digital city in Malaysia and in this region? Maybe we can start with uh, Mr. Ku. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. James. So in terms of, um, uh, look at the smart city perspectives, right? Basically, that's, uh, everybody to talk about this uh, digital city, how that digital city to create the new values to the citizens and so on. So, um, the demands that basically that we can look at that we have one the use case. I mean that we are helping this uh, coaching to build the smart cities. Basically, that uh, we are be helping them to develop the framework with the master plans. And then we have this um, 15 uh, initiative to be put into this um, master plan of uh, smart city. 
So for right now, we are be ongoing with the phases to help customers to be developed on this kind of smart city. I think this is one of the demands uh, requests from uh, Indonesia. Okay, thank you. Maybe let's hear from Puan Noesha, right? Having developed or, or spearheaded champion uh, Penang Smart City, how was it? The, you know, a, a, a supply-driven or demand-driven situation. Okay, um, basic. Okay, maybe I just share with you how we started this, uh, the smart city initiative. As you all know, that um, Penang government is a very is a progressive government. So uh, when we started in 2016, 17, something like that, uh, Selangor has started Johor, eh, 2015 earlier, much earlier. Um, but of course, when we talk about smart, smart city, uh, we have to look at what kind, what type of use cases that uh, people use. Yeah? Um, I don't know, at that time, we can't see, I mean, we don't see it in, in any place in Malaysia. So the state government decided to, you know, to do a benchmark visit to other countries like uh, Barcelona, uh, Manchester, even we went to Shenzhen. Uh, the headquarters of Huawei. And uh, from there, um, of course, um, there's a lot of uh, things that uh, we can learn from the cities. So we come back and we have decided to look into three major things, which is the, um, the, the waste management, yeah? Uh, look into the issues like waste management, um, and then traffic management, as well as on the safety and security. So with those uh, in hand, we'll be able to, you know, supply people with the, uh, the, the use cases that they need, the needs. Yeah? And of course, during the pandemic, during the pandemic, we have this, um, we, we need to reduce the contact, yeah? contact between among people, among the, uh, among things, so um, the state government decided to start with a cashless, cashless initiative, whereby it helps to you know to reduce the the contact. I mean, the the spread of COVID and so on. And basically, as at to date, I just share with you, um, we have millions of transactions via cashless, and 70 percent of our transaction in the government sector is via cashless. So, um, of course, we look into the back end of things, right? Uh, because people might not be familiar with this, this, time, this kind of technology. So we need to have something to help expedite or accelerate this kind of uh, transformation into digitalization and so on. So uh, I think that's the focus in the Penang State Government. Besides other, uh, of course, we look into five uh, domain in our roadmap. That is the smart economics, smart community, smart environment, smart government, and smart mobility. So those are our focus for the time being, uh, Doctor. And of, uh, I think I pass, maybe next uh, session, I will you know, talk about how we strengthen our core trust, yeah? which sure. means the data, uh, the people, the infrastructure, and the governance part. Yep. So, Mr. Prabhupada, right, as a service provider, right, from a supply-demand point of view, do you have to try very hard to convince your customer that, you know, putting in digital technology is actually worth the investment? So, is it more of a supply or a demand-driven approach for you? Thank, thank you. How, how has it changed before and after COVID-19? Um, Yes, I think that uh, at the end of the day, the commercial realities uh, drive a lot of these initiatives in terms of adoption or non-adoption. Huh? So even though, for example, take uh, a microcosm of the smart city, let's say a smart building, so, you know, we have chiller optimization systems with autonomous operations. And while it saves energy and it reduces your carbon footprint, the commercial reality is that uh, the adoption rate in Malaysia is low compared to the adoption rate in Indonesia, Philippines, and Thailand. 
And the reason for that is that we have the lowest electricity tariff. Now, that tariff might be artificial or real. It's a different issue. But the fact of the matter is that the same building in Malaysia will save you 50,000 USD a year as opposed to the exact same building in Thailand will save you maybe 100,000 USD just because the tariff is different. So a shorter break-even time and Absolutely. therefore more attractive you know, uh, for overseas right, uh, customer than in Malaysia. But do you think that is going to change? Um, I don't know if the tariff will change. <laughs> but uh, adoption is changing because two things are taking place. Regulation related to carbon credits and awareness related to wanting to save the planet. Do you see any change of uh, customer you know, uh, responses pre and post COVID-19? Um, absolutely. A lot more. You know, COVID-19 accelerated our growth because COVID-19 required autonomous operations to be in place because you didn't have people and you needed people to be remote. Okay, so market demand come in, right? And it has increased as a result of the pandemic. Yeah. Right, okay, let's hear from uh, architect Ahila, right? So from Think City point of view, right? What, you know, are this what customers want? To digitize their services, to digitize, you know, uh, to be able to access themselves? You know, that's, that's an interesting question. And uh, uh, Dr. James, I gotta let you know, sometimes people don't know what they need, right? So it has to be um, dual. Uh, you'd have to take a dual approach where it's a top-down as well as a bottom-up initiative. Um, I don't think you should not engage with community. You absolutely should because sometimes, you know, when you are, in a, you, you have a bird's eye view. A lot of people who are in policy or people who are providing services, they look at it in a bird's eye view and say, this is what the community needs. But when you go down, turun padang, go down to the ground, you realize that what you think you think no, it's not what you know, right? But at the same time, uh, people don't necessarily know what they want. Let me give you an example. Um, let's look at the simple things like banking, right? Banking uh, in terms of doing online banking. For the longest time, I'm sure in the audience you have family members, fathers, grandfathers who refuse to use online banking. And they want to see, you know, you go to the, the teller machine, you want to see the paper printed out, then only you are confident that your money is in. Um, the pandemic was a great shift because for people who've been doing online banking like me for years, uh, then now the older generation was forced to do it. So sometimes it is a dual push. It's not just top down, it's bottom up as well. And you need to understand what their challenges are because perhaps they didn't have a smartphone. Perhaps they don't know how to use a smartphone, right? So that is something that we need to teach them. We need to equip them with the knowledge base. But at the same time, it cannot be one way or other. It has to be both ways so that you have a balance that is achieved. So in, in that sense, I think the community knows what it wants, but sometimes we also need to push them and steer them towards what is perhaps for the greater good. Okay, thank you. So if you were to think of one thing, right, that Malaysia can export, right, based on, you know, the, the lessons and your experience, uh, what is the one thing that Malaysia, Malaysia can bring to the ASEAN region, right? One thing. Uh, Mr. Ku, can we continue with you? Malaysia can export to the ASEAN region about digital cities. Yeah, I think that things that I think is um, be wiser, maybe it's a census. I think for IoT uh, census, the terminal devices, maybe these are the things that we can produce, uh, make in Malaysia. I think another one is more to the talents. Malaysia is one of it, uh, is a uh, have these kind of various of talents to be in this ICT, ICT's uh, um, fields. Basically, that's also a way to provide the kind of tech for all programs to develop a lot kind of uh, ICT talents to personals, to organizations, 
even to everyone uh, in, uh, in Malaysia as well. Yeah, I think that maybe we can be have this uh, joints like um, R and D with the organizations together to be have this uh, made in Malaysia products for this kind of uh, digital cities. Can be for every anchors. Okay, yeah. thank you. Puan uh, Noisha, one thing. Wow, one thing. It's a very difficult question. Uh, I don't know because I'm, uh, I'm from the government part side, yeah. So I look more into, you know, our, uh, on the governance, eh? governance of, to do things eh? like a uh, roadmap, like uh, policies and so on. Uh, but that's the thing. The cost of doing business here is much higher than our Asian counterparts, right? As in. Um, you know, to give permits for telecommunication infrastructure and so on. But I guess uh, we are good, like uh, what uh, Mr. Ku shared just now. Uh, we are good at design, designing uh, IoT, like sensors and so on. We are good with, with that. Uh, and of course, the talent, yeah? the talent here in Malaysia, they are wonderful. So maybe, um, those are the things that we should you know, share with our Asian markets, uh, okay. Asian friends. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Prabhut? Um, <clears throat> since it's one thing, intelligence. Um, I think that we have got a lot of innovative, intelligent innovations here. And uh, I'm one of them. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we've got a lot of intelligent innovations by Malaysians. And I think that uh, that would be our strongest way to export our innovations and improve our ever dear currency. Okay, thank you. Uh, Akita Ahila. Um, interesting question, though, uh, you know, I, I don't think we should try to export our talent. Like, you know, if anything, we are lacking of talent here. We should try to keep them here and, you know, uh, hold on to them. Um, I think what we would, I, I, one thing that I realize is that because of the way Malaysians are, you, you know, you could call it in a negative way, we are very obedient, right? Um, but there's a positive spin to it, which is that we are very adaptable. You know, when there's something new that comes about and uh, there's a push from top down saying you need to use it, we actually toe the line and use it. And that's where you see great things happen, right? Be it using my Sejatra during the pandemic. If it was in a Western country, they'd probably say, Big Brother is watching, people are tracking me, you know? But um, as an Asian culture, we see the value of the collective. You know, kita jaga kita. Let's do it together because it is beneficial for everybody. I think that's the attitude that we should try to share with uh, the surrounding areas. But we should keep our talent. Don't yeah. export. <laughs> yeah, sure. I think, you know, when we think of digital cities, right, there are four, to me, four important pillars. One now I, I remember. It's actually in the, you know, in, in what they share, right? So number one is basically the digital infrastructure itself, right? The connectivity, the ICT. Number two is about, you know, the services. I think a lot of time we think of uh, smart city, we think of these two things, right? But I think we like to go beyond, right? When you think of digital city, you need to think about culture. You need to think about sustainability. So these are the four things, right? I know we have 10 more minutes left. Let's try to, you know, cover maybe briefly, right? So number one on the, maybe I talk, you know, maybe I ask uh, uh, Mr. Prabhu on what is your assessment of the existing infrastructure, right? Digital infrastructure in the country. Uh, readiness for, you know, the, the implementation or adoption of Digital cities. Um, <clears throat> okay, so in, in a lot of the installations that we do, we require to install IoT sensors, yeah? And uh, the infrastructure to install IoT sensors are not in place, thus requiring us to do a lot of cabling, wiring, and thus driving our costs up, as opposed to a building being IoT ready. So if you ask me, I think that the first thing we need to do uh, is to look at infrastructure 
and especially and particularly IoT infrastructure, because almost anything smart that you want to do, you need to use your sensors, yeah? We need to use our eyes, our ears, our hands, you know? And that's what sensors do. It's your eyes to the ground, and I think that that's the single most important thing. Okay. So once you have the IoT, you have the devices, you need something else, right? You need the other infrastructure that come along with it. Absolutely. For example, connectivity, you, have, you need to have data center, you need to have, go back again, you, know, you need to have cloud computing, you need to have data center, then you also need to have the 5G infrastructure to connect all, all of the things. Maybe, Mr. Ku, can we hear your comment, your view on you know, the readiness of the infrastructure, digital infrastructure in the country? Right, um, for infrastructure point of view, right, maybe, um, connectivity is very important for to connect those IoT wires and wireless. This is even the last mile on the connectivity to all this, including the CCTV and so on. I, bis I think basically we are be facing the difficulty is that last mile of the connectivity because we need to have a lot of involve a lot of civil works, a lot of things that we need to be taking to consider. So connectivity is one of it. And also the back end is that the brand we call is the intelligent operating centers. So this is very important that we have this, those things to connect today. And how you can be have this to be monitors and how you can be have this consolidated all the data, become the big data, to become the very useful reporting to for you to be PGN in this kind of IOC centers. It's a very uh, big screen for a large dashboard to show everything and easier for those higher measurements to make decisions for, for this all this data. Right. Yeah. So, so I think unlike the more developed countries, right, developing countries in this region, generally like in Malaysia, we find that there's great opportunities for infrastructure build up because that is where the critical gap is, at least for the next one to two years or few, next few years until the critical infrastructure are ready right, to be able to, to, to help to provide the kind of mission critical cloud computing and all the other services that will be required. So now, we move on to services, right? Uh, Puan, Puan Aisha, uh, from your experience, right, what, what would be the most useful kind of, uh, I mean, from data point of view, from AI and also from the useful tools Right, what are those that are important when you think of the, the use cases for pinning smart city? So basically, uh, you know, we, we talk about use cases, huh? some things that benefit to the people. Yeah? It must be something that benefit to the people, something that be able to solve people's everyday life. Yeah. And when you talk about smart, so smart has to have three elements, that is uh, the IoT, the data, the big data, and as well as the machine learning. So at the end of the day, I believe that what people need are the smart apps, the super apps, that be able to, you know, make their life easier yeah, with the apps. It's connected to one another. Um, in Penang, we have 107 smart initiatives. Uh, PT1 that already implemented um, initiative, which means that projects and programs. So the rest are already, I um, mean, in the pipeline. Um, and basically, uh, with all of these uh, apps or system, we need it to be integrated in one platform. So that's the thing that we have yet to look into, right? What would be your one advice for other, you know, smart city or for other councils? who is looking at, you know, uh, digital city development? Um, of course, um, the, the challenges will be, one, I mean, the main challenges will be the, the fund. I mean, the, the, uh, how you're going to fund these, uh, these use cases, right? So that's why we, you know, we look into PFI, the public, uh, private funding initiative. Yeah, to help the state, especially like Penang, we don't really have that uh, much um, revenue to to uh, to fund. I mean, to support our smart initiatives. So basically, we work uh, with the you know private company, like uh, one of our initiatives like is uh, Penang Smart Parking. 
is a 100% PFI or the capex opex uh, bear by the company by the operators. So it's actually one um, apps that really help to seem I mean to to uh, ease people's everyday life, especially when they wanted to search for parking because it uh, comes with the navigation uh, application as well. And of course, um, we need. And other part of it, I think, uh, I know we have time to share, but what I would like to share here, the most important thing is to have, um, you know, our telecommunications, basically, the connectivity and so on, it must be in place first, right? Okay, so public-private partnership, yeah. right, that bring in the sustainability part of it. Now, let's move on to the next, right? which is the culture part of it. How do you make it stick? How do you, you know, so-called, how do you make sure that, you know, people are engaged, right? Ahila, how, how do you ensure digital inclusion? How do you ensure, you know, uh, while you're getting the feedback and doing the right thing from, you know, the, the, the various stakeholders' point of view, how do you ensure that this will stick, this will become part of the culture of the digital city? Um... You know, that's, that's a very tough question because culture is something that changes over time unless there's something that is, uh, happens that is very shocking, like the pandemic. If not, it always takes a long time to happen. Uh, the thing is that I think that Malaysians, by and large, they're open to technology. They're not close-minded. They are open to technology, and that is the reality. I think the culture part is easier to move if you engage with them to understand what they actually need. Um, again, we, we are looking at it from the big perspective. If you, if you go to the ground, you will find that the B40 communities, um, 5G is fantastic, but they don't have the devices that will support 5G, right? And how do you make it available for them? And that needs to be something that it's a bigger conversation, right? And it has to come from top down. And I think that once they have that, culture will change. But intrinsically, when you go back to how you want to change culture, you have to go back to education. And that is key. That is key. Um, it's not just... Uh, it, it's from an early age. You start that, they use technology, once they start using it at a young age, it just snowballs because you will use it, your family will use it, everybody will use it. I think at the end of the day, uh, the big push has to come from for a cultural shift to happen. The education needs to start first. And how do you include the ESG component to make it sustainable? All this thing about net zero, decarbonisation, how, how do you incorporate that part? That's not going to be so easy. But if you, if you do get people onto a platform, i give you an example. Uh, this is a very small example. There are many ways to do it. Uh, the example of, uh, for instance, if GST comes back, right, after the elections, if the new government imposes GST, if you have cashless payment, like what you're having in Penang, and you have data that you collect from there, GST will be a lot easier to be tracked so that in terms of revenue for the government, for governance part of it, which is what the government needs in terms of revenue in order to develop a country, right? So that is one small way of doing it. In terms of environmental, because of climate change, there's a lot of, again, going back to IoT, in terms of how do you have an early warning system when it comes to flash floods. There's a flood, I mean, flooding season is upon us right now. We don't have an early warning system. And it's not rocket science, technology is available, but the adoption of it is not happening fast enough. So how do we do that? So there's like environmental, there's governance, social again, it goes back to education. Right, I think, you know, we run out of time. So final quick one, basically, you know, just to, either it's a quick win or your advice, right? For, to, to make this a success, right? Not only for, for you know, our country, but in this region, what is your advice to make you know, digital city initiative or transformation happen? What is your advice? Uh, Mr. Ku? Yeah, in terms of this, um, to develop of this, I think uh, we might be thinking of how we're going to create the new values for these digital cities. 
we might be benefit to all the citizens and solve their existing um, their problems, right? To like safety, traffic control, how from all these digital can help all the citizens to solve their uh, ladies' uh, problems. Solve actual industry okay. problems. Yeah. Okay, Puan Noisha. Just duplicate. Duplicate the best use cases. Right? Don't do on your own. Because uh, basically, um, most of the smart initiative will take into consideration of all aspects, like people, public engagement, and so on. So like, um, I mean, Penang, uh, we have a lot of our initiative that actually we benchmark from other states or other countries. So... Okay, benchmark, learn from others, yes. and innovate from there. Yeah. Okay, thank Just you. Just duplicate, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Prabhupada? Um, I guess I'm going to differ from Ponaisha. Uh, I think we should stop following. I think we should allow innovation. Uh, and I think that uh, I come from a commercial side and I have a lot of time faced uh, uh, forums where I've had to present or pitch to, to, for a grant or things like that. And I, I personally feel that our decision makers are not uh, apt enough to make the right decisions. They don't understand the technology and they fear adopting new technologies because it has not been done before. I think we should celebrate failure and not be afraid of it. Okay, keep learning and innovating, right? Um, Akita Ahila? <laughs> I actually agree with you. I think what we need is more innovation and we have capable people and that goes without saying. So if you look at retaining talent, allow them that failure. I think that's where we're very harsh with our people. So allow them that failure to continue innovating. And I think uh, policy makers need to support local innovation and they need to support local industry. We do have the talent. Okay, we get you. Keep the talent, educate them, learn, right? And then, you know, involve with the policy holders. And I think, you know, the industry can be very successful only if there is also full government support to nurture and to, to, to grow this uh, nascent industry, right? I think the, the private sector cannot work alone. I think this is where the public and the private sector need to come together to also, you know, uh, help to allow this industry to grow to a certain level until they can stand on their own. I, I think this is what we see in all the, our regional countries as well for something new to, to come in, you definitely need government support and, and the policy and, and the guidelines that, that, you know, uh, that, that are accommodative as well. So with that, I think we thank you for all our panelists. Give them a hand of applause, right? And thank you for the audience. Dr. James, may I ask, are there any questions from the floor on your iPad? Uh, good news or bad news? No lah. No, no, that's great. That means you guys have been really comprehensive. Once again, a round of applause to our panellists and uh, our Thank dear moderator you. as well, Dr. James T. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as we collate our thoughts uh, for this particular uh, 